I've entitled today's sermon, A Call to Sexual Purity, and we're continuing our study in 1 Thessalonians. This morning we're in chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 1 through 8. So let's ask the Lord's blessing before we read the Word. Father, today we come again to you and ask that you will give us understanding as we read your Word. Help us to receive it with joy. Uh, Lord, we need you to illuminate our hearts and minds and transform us by your grace as you give us understanding. And so we ask all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse one, verses 1 through 8, this is God's Word. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So thus ends the reading of God's word, and may he add his blessing to our understanding in Jesus' name. You know, my parents live in North Carolina in the home where I was raised since I was four years old. They live in a little town called Boonville. And they have a vegetable garden behind their house during the spring and summer months. Well, they have a fence around that garden because if they don't, then rabbits and deer will come and will eat the plants. And without that fence, many of the vegetables would never be produced because there are so many hungry critters in the neighborhood. They will browse the plants just enough to kill the plant. They care nothing of the vegetables, just the plants. But that fence is essential, or they wouldn't have a successful garden. And I was thinking about that as I was studying this text this, this week, and it reminded me of what one author said about our sexuality. He said, it's a lot like a garden, and that in God's Word, especially in a passage like this, the, the one we're reading this morning, God's Word acts as a fence to protect what is good and beautiful and God-ordained concerning our sexuality. It protects us from being spoiled by what is ugly and deformed and repugnant in this sinful world. So here we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you remember, uh, overall, our theme has been how to live in the last days. And one of the things we've been saying is the last days, according to Paul and other New Testament writers, well, that refers to the time between Christ, uh, Jesus' first coming and His second coming. And so we've been living in the last days for the last 2,000 years. And in this point in the letter, we've now come to a turning point. Paul is now going to give us practical instruction for what he's been teaching. I hope you notice the order of this epistle here because Paul never strays from it. He first of all tells us what God has done for us. And now, if we can put it this way, he's going to tell us what to do about it. And he never reverses the order in any of his writings. Because if you reverse the order, well, you lose the gospel. He, it's never reversed. He, he doesn't tell you what to do and then tell you what God has done. Uh, he says, here's what God has done for you and for your salvation and really for your good. And here's what you're called to do in response to what God has done. And in the Thessalonians' day and in our day, the societal problems are almost the same. In the hyper-sexualized context in which we live, and whether that's in Merritt Island, Florida, or anywhere else in the West, Paul would find that the society in our day was just like the one in which he was writing in Thessalonica. Some of the same kinds of sin, some of the same kinds of problems, and as you read what Paul says here, it almost appears that the Thessalonians had asked Paul, okay, if Jesus has come and he is coming again, what about the rampant sexual immorality around us? How are we supposed to live in light of that? And we can ask that same question today. Okay, Paul, how then shall we live? Well, he gives us the answer this morning. Now, the main thing I want to consider from these eight verses is, very simple. It's, here's the big idea. 
Paul calls the sexually broken to pursue holiness by His grace. And we're going to look at that under two headings. In verse 1, through the first part of verse 6, we're going to see how we're going to look at the way of grace for the sexually broken. And then in the last half of verse 6 all the way to the end of verse 8, we're going to look at the reason for pursuing grace for sexual brokenness. So our first point this morning, the way of grace for the sexually broken. Look at verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you ought to receive, that as you receive from us, how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Now that word translated here, finally, well, that's a bit misleading because Paul here goes on for another two chapters. What the word actually means is, as for other matters, or furthermore, so he's not drawing a conclusion here. Rather, he's now turning his attention to answer certain questions, we surmise, that have been asked of him, or some issues he knows about that need to be addressed. And as he begins to do that, notice what he says. We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. And then what Paul do, is doing here is wonderful. He's saying, these are not my opinions. And he's, he's going to bookend this section with a very similar phrase at the end of verse 8 that says, Whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God. And we'll get to that in a moment. But Paul bookends this instruction here about our sexuality saying, This is not my opinion. And one of the things that you'll find in the Apostle's writing is he has this acute awareness of the inspiration of Holy Spirit who is guiding him and directing him as he writes. And he's giving these instructions to believers, and as he's writing to God's gra about God's grace to them, it's never Paul's opinion. The Bible is not a book of opinions. This is, it's not man's uh, highest reaching after the divine. It's special revelation from above coming down to us below to tell us who God is. It's not man's opinion, as so many people want to tell us today. Then notice what he calls us to do, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk, and then he explains that by the next phrase when he says, and to please God. So our lives demonstrate the reality of our faith or the lack thereof, whichever is the case. For Paul, that word walk figures preeminently in his theology on how we are to live life. For Paul, the walk refers to our dominant trajectory, as one theologian put it. So what is your tra trajectory this morning? What is the trajectory of your life? That's why Paul uses the metaphor of a walk. When you're walking, you're generally heading somewhere. You're never just going about aimlessly. Because there are certain underlying assumptions and things that motivate people in their walk through life. I mean, even if a person is apparently doing nothing with his or her life, they are still living by a set of principles. Probably not a good set, but nevertheless, they're living by a set of principles. So whether you're a Christian or not, you're, you're still living by a code of some sort. But if you are a Christian, then you are living by faith and endeavoring to follow Jesus in your life, all the principles and precepts that are found in Scripture. And your life and my life is demonstrating the reality of what we truly believe. And Paul's saying, our lives are like a walk, and they are either in the direction toward more Christ-likeness or in the direction away from that. So he says, we ask and urge you that as you walk, you ought to walk in a way that pleases God. And notice what he does then. Not only is Paul going to instruct, but he also encourages. He says, just as you are doing, just as you're doing that, you need to do that more and more. Keep doing that. He's saying, you're doing this, but I want you to do it more and more. And this really answers what we saw a few weeks ago, back in chapter 3, verse 10, as he said to them then, I want to supply what is lacking in your faith. This is, this is what he is going to tell us about. This is, this is what he's going to do. This is the supply of that further needed instruction. He says it's about your walk with God. It's about your shared life with God, as it were. For the Apostle Paul, our lives demonstrate the reality 
of our faith. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, For you know what instructions we gave you. Notice again, he says, through the Lord Jesus. And why does he put that there again? Because of what he's about to say. He's telling us in so many words, God cares deeply about what we do with our bodies. It matters greatly to Him. We are enfleshed creatures. We are not those who believe that there is some radical separation between body and soul to the point that in order to really be spiritual, well, you need to disregard the body. God made us body and soul. He, he gave them to us. And yes, we're created in His image, and there's some mystery there concerning His design for humanity. I mean, God is spirit, and yet we have a soul, but He also gave us a human body. And due to the fall in the Garden of Eden, when we were horribly marred by sin, even so, God redeems and He governs the spiritual and the physical. In the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to have perfectly glorified bodies. But that doesn't mean that what we do with our bodies now doesn't matter in this life. As God's redeemed images, He calls us to use our bodies in a way that evidences the reality that we have been redeemed by Christ. In our walk of faith, we are to foreshadow, glimpse, and point forward to that new creation one day. And of course, that doesn't mean that we can somehow escape the deterioration of our bodies and even you know, the eventual physical death that we're all going to experience in this life, or that we need to focus on our bodies in an idolatrous way way. That's not what it means. Rather, our bodies as believers, Paul will say elsewhere, are temples of the Holy Spirit. And as he was instructing the Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 to flee from sexual immorality, Paul exhorted them, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So indeed, God the Father created our bodies, God the Son redeemed our bodies, and God the Holy Spirit indwells our bodies. This makes our body the very temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Then he goes on in verse 3, and here's the answer to an age-old question. Countless pages of ink have been written on this, and we have the answer for us right here in the text. What is the will of God for your life? Paul tells us right here, what am I supposed to do with my life? He says in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's God's will in your life. And what does he mean by that word sanctification? It's really a word that means being set apart. And if we kind of tweak that a little bit further, what Paul means by it is very simple. When you're sanctified or when you're being sanctified, you're continually being set apart from the world to God by His grace and by His grace alone. As we read in our catechism uh, question this morning and the affirmation. I'm just going to give you part of it. I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but we were talking about sanctification there. And part of our affirmation is uh, sanctification is a work of God's free grace, it says a few other things, and then whereby having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into our hearts, here's the key, we are stirred increasingly and strengthened more and more to die into sin and to rise to newness of life. So in essence, we're dying to sin and we're living to righteousness, being separated from the world and separated to God. And then Paul gets very specific in three ways in this context. How are, we, how are these Thessalonian believers, and really how are we also, to evidence this walk, this being set apart from God, from, excuse me, set apart from the world to God? He gives three specific ways. And first, look at the first part here. He says, in verse 3, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, the word that Paul uses here refers to any kind of activity outside the marital bond of one man and one woman for life. God alone defines marriage, not man. God alone sets the boundaries for our sexuality, not man. And God says through Paul that anything outside of biblical marriage is sexually immoral. Interestingly, the Greek word used here is the word from which we get Pornography. And quite literally, that word means sexually immoral writings. I mean, pornea is the Greek word for fornication. Graphe, of course, is the Greek word for writing. And that's the root that Paul's using here. He says, you abstain from sexual immorality. And then in verse 4, he gives the next instruction. 
He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So Paul now magnifies the previous verse. He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor. You see the contrast? Do it this way. Follow God's plan and will, not like what you see, what you see going on around you, uh, control your body, gain mastery over it. That's what he's saying. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles, but in holiness and in honor. Now, if you think we live in an immoral and a sexually confused society, uh, you ought to read some of the accounts of first century Rome and what was going on in Paul's day. I mean, it might shock you if you read it. And the people to whom he is writing are people who have come out of horrible sexual immorality, and all kinds of wickedness. And, and Paul is saying to them, you know, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb in society when you start living for Jesus. And dear friends, what a contemporary application that has for us today. I mean, does that not describe our culture perfectly in the passion of lust? I mean, everything around us is, is designed to arouse lust in us. Everything from advertising to movies and even music. I mean, those things are not bad in and of themselves. I mean, certainly the content has to be evaluated. I mean, it might be bad in some cases, but we have to recognize that any of these can cross over easily into sin, so we have to be discerning. Paul says, you are surrounded by this passion of lust, but I want you to live in a certain way. This is God's will for you. This is how this should turn out. Now, what's remarkable is an, inter an interesting fact about this verse that scholars, have they've, as they've looked at uh, and an other ethical writers during uh, Paul, Paul's time, different ethicists of the first century in the Greek and Roman worlds, well, there's no record of any of them teaching anything like holiness and sanctification. That concept is functionally absent from Roman and Greek writing. They will speak about the good life. They will speak about the highest virtue. But they will never speak about pursuing these things in holiness and honor. So Paul's telling them to do something that's very radical in their society. And he's telling us the same thing. Better yet, the Lord Jesus, through Paul, is telling us that. You see, everything around us says, do whatever you want with your body. Isn't that the message to us today? Your body's your own. You do with it as you please. But the gospel says to us, do what Christ calls you to do with your body because His body was broken for yours. That's, that's the difference between the gospel and everything else. Do what Christ calls you to do because His body was broken for yours. So here in the last, is the last that phrase here in verse 6. He says that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. The word wrong he uses literally means to defraud. Paul says if we are involved in any kind of sexual immorality outside the bonds of marriage and we are quite literally stealing from another person, we're defrauding another person. Human sexuality is a, is a precious gift from God. And Paul says that when we act outside of His wise, good, and loving restraint, we are stealing from another hum, human being that which can never be replaced. And that's why it's such a serious matter for God. He says, don't be spousal thieves. Don't be stealing from another human being. Now before we look at the, the second point in a general way, why is Paul giving us this instruction? Remember his prayer last week that we considered? That we, that we may abound in love for one another and for all. That's what he told us. Well, now he's applying that. What does it mean to abound for one another and for all? Well, right here, he says, don't defraud. Don't do things to other people that God has not called you to do with your sexuality. Follow what he says. That's one of the best ways to show love today. And we have such a twisted view in our culture today of intimacy and love because of the rampant, over-sexualized and pagan immorality that's running amok in our society. We've really lost what it means to love biblically. 
And Paul wants to restore that. Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, says, You and I are to love one another well by protecting and gaining mastery over our bodies and using them in a way that God has intended. And then point two is in the second place here. Paul gives us a reason to do this. So point two on your outline, the reasons for pursuing grace for sexual brokenness. Look at the last part of verse six. These are the reasons for pursuing grace for sexual brokenness. He says, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as he told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but for holiness. So here's the first reason Paul says to pursue grace. We'll talk about what we mean by pursuing grace in a moment. But why does he tell us to do it? Well, because the Lord is an avenger for those who violate his commands in this regard. From Genesis to Revelation, when you read the Bible, God singles out sexual sin as one of the key evidences of who we belong to. Either Satan and his kingdom of darkness or the Lord Jesus and His kingdom of light. But more simply, eternity is at stake in your bedroom. That's what Paul's saying. That's why this is such a serious matter for us to consider this morning. Now think about our society today. You know, personally, I think much of the sexual immorality that we see in our culture today really gained a, a foothold in our culture back in the 60s. I'm not saying it didn't exist before that, but I'm talking about the foothold, the turning point, if you will. Once we get to the 60s, with all the, of the rampant heterosexual immorality, well, that paved the way for Roe v. Wade in, in 1973, when we started calling babies in the womb unintended consequences. And when you sanction the taking of human life, created in the image of God, under the guise of women's rights, well, you open up the floodgates. I think that paved the way for no-fault divorce and the redefinition of marriage that we've seen in recent years. Do you see that what's happening all around us is the absolute breakdown of any kind of Christian understanding of how we're to use our bodies? And it has one theme, and one theme common across the board, which is any kind of sexual sin really goes directly against what Paul is saying here. It is seeking to pursue self-gratification instead of glorifying God with our bodies. Instead of loving others well, it turns inward and it loves self, which is the very opposite of biblical love, the very opposite of that for which God designed marriage. And one of the things that we're called to do as we live in a society like this as Christians is to celebrate the goodness of marital love between one man and one woman for life. And if you're here this morning and you're married, well, that's what God has called you to do. It's one of the things that glorifies Him in this world around us. If you aspire to be married and you're not yet married, well, please don't settle for anything less but the real thing. That's what Paul's saying. A marriage that brings glory to God in every facet and which resists the hyper-sexualized society around us. And dear friends, only the Holy Spirit can do this. Only the Spirit can produce this in our lives. That is what we are called to do, though. And so what we do with our bodies matters more than we can possibly imagine. Have you considered that? Because we tend to think, no big deal. Everyone else is doing these kinds of things. And Paul calls us back to reality this morning. This is how he finishes here in verse 8. If we make our decisions... And we say to God, I don't care what your word says. I'm going to do whatever feels right. I'm going to do whatever I want. I mean, that's the motto today, right? Do whatever feels right. But look at what verse 8 says. Therefore, now here is a conclusion to this section on his teaching. He says, therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. He says, you turn away from this and you're putting your fingers in your ears when God is speaking to you about how you're supposed to live with your body. And not only our bodies, but we do that in all other kinds of areas in our lives. We put our fingers in our ears and disregard what God has said. 
And then did you notice the note of grace that Paul finishes on here? Isn't it marvelous and hopeful? He says, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God gives this. He alone gives us the power to change. It's only Holy Spirit that can do this. It's not a, you know, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps kind of religion. It is the Spirit working in and through us by His Word to transform us and to bring glory to God in all of these things that Paul has just given us. Uh, And Holy Spirit points us to Jesus and the unconditional love and acceptance we have with God in the gospel. So if you fall in in this area of your life, well, there's grace and there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Just confess your sin and repent and look to Jesus and believe the gospel. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. No need to walk around for the rest of your life in guilt and shame. Uh, That won't do you any good anyway. You can't change your past, but you can walk differently in the future by God's grace. That's what we mean by pursuing grace for for the sexually broken. You know, I've been in pastoral ministry for almost 20 years now. One of the biggest struggles, without exception, regardless of age, gender, race, or class, is that people struggle with shame. They may not even realize it, but that's one of the big struggles people have. Shame leads to covering up the shame, or trying to, whether through addictions, you know, some kind of self-medication, living inauthentically, uh, being a workaholic, all kinds of things, isolation, whatever it is. And so much shame that we experience in this life comes from how we have used our bodies, you know, either for God's glory or if we've used them in a sexually immoral way. So the question is, does Jesus help the sexually broken? And the the best news in the world is a resounding yes. How so? Well, he lived a perfectly pure life every moment he was on planet Earth. We need to meditate on that pretty often, I think. It needs to fill us with joy that every moment of Jesus' life, when He was tempted as we are in every way, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, our Savior was a healthy man. He was tempted in ways uh, that include any temptation that we face. And yet He obeyed perfectly at every point for our sake. He did that also to cover our shame. As Paul put it elsewhere, He was obedient to the point of death. He covered our shame. And your shame and my shame, if it's brought to Jesus, is atoned for. It's gone. It's covered by the blood of Jesus, never to be brought up again. Regardless of how much the accuser accuses us, we have the blood of Jesus. We have His perfect life. We have His perfect obedience to cover us where our our sin brings shame. That's absolutely amazing. That alone, that great historical fact, that reality, my friends, that is the resource for change by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the other way God helps us is, yes, He gives us Holy Spirit to help us. And elsewhere, Paul had told the Romans what that means in very rich terms. He said, it is the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. This same Holy Spirit who is working in us to obey these instructions and to glorify God with our bodies, that also assures us that we are His beloved adopted children. We are no longer exiles and strangers. We're no longer left out of the wedding feast. We're no longer cast away by our sin, but we're brought into the family, given Holy Spirit to begin to bear the family resemblance. That is sanctification. It's the beginning daily, day by day, moment by moment, to bear the resemblance of Jesus, our older brother, as we are his younger siblings, as it were, adopted into God's family. Adoption that will never be changed by our past, our present, or our future. Adoption that continues on throughout eternity. Adoption where God says to us, I love you too much to leave you where you are this morning. I am going to work in your life to change you. That's why he gave us Holy Spirit. And this is good news for us. It would be a terrible thing to preach this passage and not say anything about that. Because you and I then would walk out of here today very discouraged. But the power is available through the blood of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So, what are some of the concrete ways that this happens in our lives? Well, let me give you three. And I touched on this somewhat earlier. 
First, how do we deal with sexual brokenness? What are the steps? What are some of the steps to a pathway toward healing? Well, as I said, confession and repentance. But along with that, we need to take radical steps sometimes, if necessary. Here's what Jesus meant when He said, uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Well, what He meant was, get away from the things that cause you to sin. Now, if that's the internet or if it's your smartphone, well, you're going to have to get away from that. It's better not to have Wi-Fi and go to heaven with your body whole than to watch things that will destroy your life and the lives of those that you love. That, that may not be the case for everyone here, but if that is your struggle, if that's your area, that you're looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at, well, you're going to have to take some radical steps. And confession and repentance, there's certainly cleansing in that. You know, when you read Psalm 51... You know, speaking of the horrible sexual sin, which eventually led to murder and manipulation and really brought the downfall of the Davidic dynasty. Well, what, what gave David release? He said, I came to you, God, and you healed and restored me. That's the promise of the gospel for all of us. Healing, restoration by confession and repentance. And, it, and it's all bought, brought about by God's amazing grace. Second thing, we need to have help from other Christians. And this is kind of what we talked about last week. We, we need each other. Isn't it amazing? Uh, we have to be the kind of place here where we can talk about these things. Uh, a place where we can confess our sins to each other and ask for prayer and support, not judgment and condemnation. In a real sense, our children's heritage is at stake. We have to teach and model for them how to, how to negotiate this sin-cursed world in which we live, especially when it comes to living biblically, sexually pure lives. And the only way we're going to see this change is as Holy Spirit's power comes in the gospel and makes people love Jesus more than sexual sin. Third thing, receive the grace of Jesus. Just receive what He offers. Walk with Him through the pages of the gospels and notice who He loves to spend time with. Sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. And, and in, in, it's fascinating that the most intense and the longest conversation Jesus ever had on worship was not with a rabbi, but with a serial adulteress. In John 4, you remember there, his conversation with the woman at the well. So in the pages of Scripture, your Savior and my Savior spent more time with sexually broken people than just about anybody else. And he's doing it still today. He's still holding out the same hope that he held out 2,000 years ago in that society that was just as broken and just as devastated by these kinds of sin as ours is, if not even more so. The same grace is available to us this moment. The same Savior looks at us this morning and says, I have plenty of grace for you, no matter where you are. You may feel trapped and enslaved this morning in the passion of lust, but the gospel is good news for you because there's freedom in Jesus Christ, freedom from your presumed bondage because in essence, He's already set you free. So when it comes to your being in bondage to this kind of sin, dear friends, don't give up. There's freedom in Jesus Christ alone. Go to Him. Father, our hearts this morning yearn to breathe the fresh air of grace that releases us from what we've already been saved from. From what your Son lived His perfect life for and hung on the cross for. And we ask now that you would give us Holy Spirit to live out what we've heard and do what your Word calls us to do. We thank you for all of these gifts today. In Jesus' name, amen.